All right, hello everyone. Welcome today to today's Sundance live stream. I'm Emily, the assistant manager here at Sundance Books and Music. And today we're thrilled to be joined by author and our old friend, Willie Vlotten. His new book, The Night Always Comes, is available in the store now. And Willie was kind enough to send us signed book plates for those as well. So make sure you get in and get a copy before they're gone. If you would like to ask a question, please leave it in the comments section and we'll get to as many as we can. For those of you who don't know, Willie Vlotten is the author of the novels The Motel Life, Northline, Lean on Pete, The Free, Don't Skip Out on Me, and now The Night Always Comes. He is the founding member of the bands Richmond Fontaine and the D-Lines. He lives outside Portland, Oregon, which is where he's joining us from today. Welcome, Willie. Hello. How are you doing? Good. I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. I'm really excited. I love Sundance, of course. Uh, it's the, you know, it was the first book. Well, no, nah, it's lying, man. There was a bookstore I really like called Bold Print before Sundance or maybe a long Sundance, but I've always bought books at Sundance since I was in high school, I think. Oh, Jeez. man. <laughs> I think that's a long fucking time ago. Yeah. 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 Before my time, probably. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Before I was even born. <laughs> Hey, it only says two participants. Is that normal? Or yep, is that's it... just you and me and everybody else is watching on YouTube. Far out. Okay. You want me to uh, do a reading? Yes, please. If you'd like to share some of the new book, we'd love that. All right. Well, I mean, I, I guess the, the, the night always comes started uh, with the idea of um, getting left behind in a couple ways. I, I, I guess I was thinking a lot about uh, a lot of the cities in the West that are growing so fast and getting so expensive to live in. I mean, Reno's even the same where housing prices have gone through the roof and rental prices have gone through the roof. Absolutely. And in Portland, I ran an office in St. John's, um, like one of the last working class parts of Portland. And um, I've watched just in the last five years, you know, housing prices in the last five years have almost doubled. And um, watching all the mom and pop stores around here sell out, and then to you know investment, real estate investment companies, and they tear them down and build apartment buildings. But at the same time, there's like homeless encampments popping up everywhere as well. So it just got me worried uh, and thinking about if you were eh, kind of a beat up family, uh, they you know like most families carry a lot of burdens, and if you were just basically getting by and then the rules change or the land the landscape changes rents suddenly go up or you try to buy a house and it suddenly goes through the roof it just made me worried i started worrying about uh uh all the people that are struggling uh you know in a change in landscape and, and so the book came from that um uh so i i guess i'll just read a little bit um here's just a scene with lynette i'm not gonna really set it up it's, uh, it's, just, it's just a little scene. Um, there was an unmarked door in the back of the Dutchman's restaurant that led to the kitchen. Lynette knocked on it until the night cleaner opened it. What do you want? Said a tall man standing in the doorway. I don't know if you recognize me, but I'm Lynette. I've worked in the bar for the last few years. We've met a couple times. I know who you are, he said. Why don't you go in through the bar entrance? Because I want to talk to you. Me, he said. Why would you want to talk to me? Your name's Cody, right? He nodded. Why do you want to know? I just want to make sure I'm talking to the right guy. Will you let me in? And I'm freezing out here and I'm getting soaked. He stepped back and let her in. Cody was 6'3", six, 6'3", three, Six three, six feet, three inches tall and weighed less than 140 pounds. He was so thin and gaunt that he looked ill. He had a straggly beard and his brown hair was curly and long. There were holes in his earlobes where he'd once had piercings. His nose was narrow and long and drooped at the end. And his arms were bony and covered in new, brightly colored tattoos. He moved back in the kitchen and Lynette shut the door behind her. Fluorescent lights shone down from the ceiling and a radio plate. The kitchen smelled of bacon grease, bleach, and cigarette smoke. Cody leaned against the prep table. 
Well, what do you want with me? I've heard you've been in prison. Well, what's that to you? He said, and took a pack of cigarettes from his pants pocket and lit one. You're not supposed to smoke in here. Why do you care? Lynette shrugged. Sorry, you're right. I have something to ask, but I need to know for a few things first. What were you in prison for? Burglary. That's what I heard, said Lynette. What did you steal? Why do you want to know? I just want to know. A half full pot of coffee sat on a warmer. He went to it and poured some into a metal travel mug. He added five packs of sugar and stirred it with a fork. I stole a lot of things, but right now I just want to get out of here and you're getting in the way of that. So what do you want? I need help doing something illegal. And I didn't know who else to ask. Shirley told me you'd been in prison. So I thought, I thought of you. And then I knew you'd be working tonight. He shook his head. The last thing I'm going to do is anything illegal. Anyway, I don't even know you. Are you sure? I'm sure. Okay. I understand, said Lynette. I don't know that much about things like this, and it's probably a bad idea, so I'll just leave you alone. But please, don't tell anyone I came to, came to see you. She headed for the door and was nearly to it when Cody said, well, I ain't gonna do whatever you're thinking, but what is it? She went back to him and stood less than a foot away and whispered, there's a safe I want, but I'm not strong enough to carry it out. I don't know how to open it. You want me to help you steal a safe? His breath smelled of coffee and cigarettes and teeth that he didn't brush. He picked up a mop that was leaned against the sink, put it in the bucket and rinsed it out. He took a drink of coffee and began mopping. No way. We could take it someplace, anywhere, and you could figure out how to open it. I can move it around so it's not bolted down and it's not that heavy either. I'm just not strong enough to carry it alone. He kept mopping. I have a key to the place and the owner has gone all night. Cody stopped and looked at her. Where is it? An apartment 10 minutes from here. What kind of safe? It's a century safe. I don't know what that means, but that's what it said on it. When I looked it up, it said you could buy them at Home Depot. She took the phone from her purse and showed him three pictures of it. What's inside it? I'm not sure that's the problem but I'll give you a third of whatever's mine if there is money in it. Someone owes me and I don't think they'll ever pay me back. How much do they owe you? $8,000. Shit, he said. Where did you get eight grand? So that's just the start of, <laughs> but really the start of Lynette's, you know, night, I guess. Yeah. So here's something jumped out at me during that. So in this story, Lynette, she's not a bad person. She just has a s circumstances that are stacked against her and something, I don't want to give too much away, but her plans to buy her house that she's grown up in are no longer viable. So throughout this night, she meets other people who seem to have, you know, their lives have also been ruled by circumstance as well. Where did these characters come from? Are these people that you've met throughout your life? Are they, you just see people, you know, in a diner and you start to think about what their stories might be or is there something specific that inspired you? I mean, one of the ideas that, that we were talking about before uh, we started to think about not sleeping. And one of the things I think about when I wake up in the middle of the night I, is I would think about like, how could it, you know, I got lucky and I bought a, a house up in Portland before it got expensive, but I was thinking, how, how could I live up here, buy a house up here, have that old American dream fulfilled if I, if I would lived here now? And there's, there's absolutely no, no way. But I started thinking about uh, President Trump's comment. Um, the, and I say it in the beginning of the book, it's uh, uh, the point is you can't be too greedy. He was talking in, about business deals, but I think there's a tendency in our country to think of, uh, of getting all you can is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And obviously uh, CEOs and investment bankers and uh, bond traders and those guys live their lives that way, taking as much as they can get. And I said, okay, okay, man, if you think 
if you think that's a good idea, this is what it looks like at the bottom. You know, the old idea of Ronald Reagan's, you know, trickle down, the, the money will trickle down to the poor people. Mm -hmm. um, well, if, if, if the greed is, if our leaders say greed's okay, if our main, if Amazon, the heads of Amazon say greed's okay, uh, then all right, then this is what it looks like on a day-to-day -day level. And so you had Lynette, who, who still believes in community. She believes in the American dream of home ownership. Home ownership. Now all of a sudden she has to go in and deal with all these really greedy, like short-sighted, everyone in the, the book that she comes across is mostly are, are short-sighted, um, you, know, uh, you know, grifter. And, and, and just out for a quick buck. They're seeing Portland as a boom town and they're trying to take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where all those guys come from. They're just different ideas of, of, of greed in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Man. Um, so also the book, I believe you said in another interview, you know, the book is so tightly plotted. It's just over like a night and a half or something. Uh, and you can kind of feel the ticking clock while Lynette is going through all these things. And I believe that you said you kind of rearranged the plot a little bit as you were writing it. Did you have, you know, something in mind or did one thing have to come before another? What, how important was that sequence or were you able to kind of play with it? Well, I, I, wanted, I wanted the novel to have a real um, panic to it. Cause I think when, when, when things change in your life, like, like all of a sudden housing prices have doubled and say you've saved for 15 years for for a down payment and then all of a sudden the game changes and um and you're like oh my god i gotta come up with twice that uh i mean for so many years it was the story of my life with reno i was always trying to buy a house in reno and i'd come up with the money that i needed to buy a house in reno 10 years before not be but I'd always, i was always 10 years too late yeah so when when things get like that when you realize that the uh the game's changing or the the rules are changing but you're still uh, it's like, I always think of it as like, you're still walking down the street, but all of a sudden people are passing you in cars and they're like nice cars. And you're like, well, how did they get the nice car? How come I'm still walking? You start to panic and, and you start to get worried. Like I should have done this. I should have done that. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And, and I wanted Lynette to have that kind of feel to her in the novel to have that feel to her where she's kind of out of her depths. She's thinking about life in one certain way. And it's, and it is passing her by. She is still walking and everyone's passing her by in cars and she can't figure it out. Yeah. yeah. And she, and she's wounded. Uh, you know, I, I, I think of all people is, is wounded, uh, some more than others. And all families carry burdens and all families have big weight on their back and weird <laughs> histories and, and dance to them. And I and I wanted to I wanted that to be a part of the story too. Is like you don't get to be the, your best self when when like an economy changes or you lose your job or housing prices go through the, through the roof and you can't keep up. That doesn't mean that you're facing that when you're looking good and feeling great. Uh, right. A lot of times you're still just kind of scraping by, and now or I always say like duct taping your life uh, together uh, to keep it together. And then all of a sudden you gotta, you gotta be better than you've been or make more money than you've ever made. And I think that's why Lynette uh, is the way she is, I, I think in, in such a complex relationship with her mother. Yeah. How much did uh, Lynette's mental health play into it when you were writing this? Did you, did you think about that or was that kind of a product of what was happening in the book? Well, I'm, I'm always interested in that sort of stuff. I think because I just have always kind of struggled, uh, I think. I, I was interested in the idea of a woman being raised as a servant. Uh, Lynette, Lynette's kind of raised to take care of her brother and not out of any kind of spite. It's a, it's a single mom um, that a developmentally disabled uh, her son and, and Lynette's brother, older brother is developmentally disabled and it just takes a lot of work. And Lynette's kind of from age 10 or 11 has become kind of like a, you know, a guardian of his, uh, a parent of his, a uh, caretaker of him uh, by 10 or 11. And the mom's just struggling to get by and struggling just to keep her family afloat. So there's, and the dad's absent. 
Um, and so, you know, I don't think Lynette ever learned how to get loved properly. Mm -hmm. And so I think at a certain level, Lynette, she gives and gives and gives until she breaks. And then when she breaks, it's ugly. You know, like when people, when you beat somebody down so far, what, how they protect themselves can be implosion or explosion. And Lynette kind of did both. She exploded and destroyed uh, to give herself some power and, and she, she beat up on herself. And so, yeah, she's a rough, she's gone through a lot of rough stuff, but, but again, I think I wanted to say like, she's, she's actually really tough and she believes, still believes in community and she'll sacrifice anything. Uh, and she might be not be the smartest person in, in how she goes about these things, but she's trying the best and as hard as she can to, to cause she sees down the distance where no one else in the book, except maybe the, the, the pudgy man she meets in the hotel room is probably the only other guy that sees the distance of what's coming and, and that, that owning a place and, and community are important. Um, uh, but everyone else is kind of, they're on their own quest for money. And, and so she's just kind of left alone. Yeah, well, it seems like what she wants most is to just have control over her life so that she can feel some sort of stability and safety. Well, I mean, I, I, I don't know if it's the same for your, your generation or whatever. Maybe my generation is the last one that really believed in, you know, I was raised that if you owned a house, you weren't a loser, you know, like if you owned a house, you made something of yourself. She, you know, my mom was always like, well, that guy, you know, he might be this and that and another thing, but he owns his own house and he's got a nice yard. And then you think about it, you're, it's right. You know, you're like, wow, the, you're, you know, if you have a mortgage, you know, the, and you have your own house, no one can kick you out unless you don't pay the mortgage and the mortgage isn't going to go, isn't going to double. Uh, and, and no one's going to tell you to paint your house a certain color or, or that you can't plant that tree or no, you can't have a dog or a cat or a parrot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you have a little power. And then, and I think with, with, you know, that old school idea, home ownership, you get pride. You know, I know I did. I bought a little house and man, I liked myself a whole lot more. Uh, probably the first time in my life, I really liked myself because I was like, well, I might be a loser, but I own this little house and that's something because I would, but that's the way I was, <laughs> that's the way I was raised. You know? Right. Yeah. And she really holds on to hope and well, she's starting to feel more and more desperate, of course, but um, she has her hope and you know, your book had me thinking about both the tenacity of hope and also some kind times the false promise of hope. But do you think that it's important to hold on to that? Or do you think that maybe it's a little bit better to be more realistic about circumstances? Well, I think being pragmatic and, and, and hopeful are two different things, I think. I mean, the, the opposite of hope is, is to give up uh, and, you know, hell, I mean, giving up just doesn't feel good. I mean, if you give up, uh, to resign yourself to something. Uh, uh, for a while, it feels good because you're like, I don't care anymore. But then it eats at you, just human nature. It eats at you. You can't just give up. I mean, you can give up by killing yourself. or, uh, uh, but, but even if you give up, like, okay, I'm going to just say, I'm going to hang out in this bar uh, for the rest of my life, you still got to have a place to live and you got to have enough money to, to drink at the bar. So there's no way to really give up. And so what, what becomes your friend who's sitting next to you at the bar is, is bitterness and self-hatred. And man, those are hard to live with. And hope is like, well, Myrna Loy can be sitting next to me. Uh, some, you know, amazing Carol Lombard can be sitting next to you, next to you if you have hope. Uh -huh. But if you don't have if you don't have hope, you got, you got nothing, man. So, so I've always believed that if you can, if you can in, in your heart think like, man, maybe if I make this chess move, maybe tomorrow I'll move a little bit forward instead of back. Um, yeah. That's an easier way to get, uh, get through the day, I think. So yeah, my books are always, I, I think in general, I'm always on that fence of hope and hopelessness just as a person or, or, being cynical or not cynical, uh, yeah. uh, uh, I'm always battling that. So my characters kind of mirror that because uh, I'm interested in that. And those are just 
you know, uh, things I, I think about it every day and, and, and struggle with in, in my own way. You know? Yeah. Well, how much of yourself do you put into your characters? At this point, now that you've written quite a few books, are you more diluted in your characters, do you think? Or is that a very basic question? Do you just, by the nature of them being your characters, are they, are you in all of them? Well, I, I will say this. I never have written a, a straight up true character and I don't think I've written a, um, more than a handful, you know, I've probably written, I don't even know how many songs I've written, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds. And I probably have under 10 that are just straight up, re, uh, you know, factual. And that was because of me. I, I, growing up, I, you know, it, it made my family really ashamed that I, or my mother really ashamed that I wrote stories and was in a band and she just was horrified that I'd write about her. And so I never did. I always masked it. I always said, look, if you're a fiction writer, you can say you can beat up your ex-girlfriend and make her a, a 65 year old truck, fat truck driver, you know, and say the same exact things, you know, or, or if you had a, a bad uncle or a, or a bad boss, you can make them an old lady or a, a or, a, you know, a 15 year old kleptomaniac. It doesn't matter. You can say the same stuff. So the hearts of all of them are, are, are the same. And, and I, I think as I might write more books, the themes of them all kind of start running together. Like you, you, you read, you read novelists and you, after a while you go, oh man, they're writing, they, they, they're just, they write the same kind of themes over and over. And I think it's, for me, it's, I'm trying to escape, I'm trying to escape those things, mm -hmm. change, change somehow or, or be different and then you realize oh shit I'm just me I got the same old monkey on my back and I got the same old scars on me I, I haven't quite figured out how to, to get rid of and uh and and so no they're all they're all the, the, the blood of them is all me and their ideas that, that I think about all the time but uh, hardly ever do I write just a straight up real person because I life's too short to, to beat up on somebody in a book I can yeah. beat up them and they won't even know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, real quick, dipping into the comments. So we have someone saying hello from Scotland. We have someone saying hello from Galway in Ireland. Oh, look, I love Galway. Galway is my, probably my, one of my favorite. Like, I, if you ever could get stranded somewhere, I would say Galway would be the place that, you know, or if I was ever rich, I'd buy a little, little shack outside of Galway. Uh, yeah, Galway is the coolest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, and then Travis, to answer your question, you can buy this book at Sundance Books and Music in Reno or on our website, sundancebookstore.com or, you know, any other bookstore. Um, so Heather asks, Willie, where are the intersections of songwriting and storytelling? Are there similar places you live in when creating each or both? I mean, I've always said the same thing, and I apologize, but it's kind of true. I always think they live in the same apartment building. Um, like the songs are on one floor and the stories are on another floor and they, they're sneaking to each other's rooms. Um, I'm interested in the same sort of themes. And, 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 and I think a lot of times writing novels, one of the hardest things about novels is they just take so long. It's like building an entire house. And so... With a song, it, you, you might be, you might write a song in a, in a, you know, sometimes they come really fast. And then sometimes, I mean, in all honesty, you might work on it for a few days over the course of a month or two months, but really you don't put in the day-to-day -day grind like you do with a, with a novel. So you spend a lot more time in the world of the novel. And so I'll write songs kind of riffing off the ideas I'm thinking of when I'm writing a novel. So they are kind of married, but I've always wanted it that way. And I've always wanted my songs to be kind of soundtracks to my stories. And, and so often my songs start the idea for the novel. Most of my novels, not this one, but most of my novels, actually every single one, but this one started as a song. Um, so they are kind of married uh, and, um, and they've been good pals to each other that, that way, I think. Yeah. Have you ever considered like writing a collection of short stories? You know, I, 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 I have a, uh, I have a stack of bad ones. Uh, you know, I did when, 
when I when I went to took night classes uh, for, with Gail Marie up at uh, Gail Marie Palmire at uh, up at UNR the University of Nevada Reno, I wrote a lot of them. Uh, and I, I you know I think I like disappearing and and I can disappear longer uh, in a novel. Um, and I think so many of my songs are like short stories. Um, but yeah, yeah, I have a, I have a, I have a book of short stories that I've written for, for 20 years, uh, that I always tinker on that I, you know, I'll eventually put out. It's a little too, uh, uh, personal at this point. Uh, so, but I'm always working, I'm always working on that book, but in general, I probably won't have a book of short stories out for, for a few years. Oh, okay. Well, when you do, I'll take credit for it, for giving you the idea. <laughs> So Michael asks, how, uh, do you have a favorite song from another writer that could be a great short story or novel? A favorite song from another writer? Yeah. I didn't get another. Yeah, uh, favorite song from another writer or one of your own that could be a great short story or novel? You mean like a songwriter, not yeah. another? Okay, yeah, I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Oh, guys, uh, um, you know, there's tons, you know, like you just, you could drop into any kind of Tom Waits, you know, uh, songs, you know, like Shore Leave. I would love to write a novel based in the world of Shore Leave by uh, Swordfish Tron Bones by uh, Tom Waits. That would be one that uh, I would love to live in that world. I'd love to be that guy, you know, uh, working on, a, you know, being like a, some kind of officer on a merchant marine ship when you're in a weird bar uh playing mid uh, playing what does he say playing uh pool with a midget and uh drinking a singapore sling and writing a letter to my wife jesus yeah i want to live in that world but no i haven't so far i kind of i kind of uh drift into my own worlds maybe late at night i, I live inside tom Waits songs all night and, and, and dream about them but i haven't i haven't riffed off it and written them yeah. All right. Bill asks, assuming the novel was partly, if not wholly written during COVID, does it reflect anything from that time or is it more of a timeless tale? No, you know, I wrote it. That's the thing with books is they take a long time. Once you write them uh, and you hand them off, it takes another good year, year and a half before it comes out. So it was done way before COVID. I remember because I just sold the book and gotten a dog at the same time. And we got we got the dog, and then COVID happened. So, uh, um, so yeah. So I had the book done and dusted maybe a year before COVID. And um, but during COVID, so it has nothing to do with that or it has any of the ideas of that. But I just wrote, I just wrote during COVID. I wrote the draft like a rough draft of a of a novel and and. Uh, that has nothing to do with COVID, but the guys, two of the guys in the in the store in the novel uh, have a, a bat, have to have a root canal, and and I was just working on it the other day, and I was like, oh shit, that's because you know during COVID, like when it first happened, I like well, I had a tooth go bad, oh, those fucking hurt, and I was like, uh, I couldn't find a dentist, you know, they're all fucking scared, that, you know, to do anything, yeah. so so that's the only COVID related thing that I have in the book is and I'm keeping it that you know there's all this there's like a 40 page thing about a guy having a bad tooth and uh okay. and that's my COVID story I think that's okay I think we're gonna be inundated with COVID stories from all kinds of writers so yeah, yeah. I mean the only weird thing I did it during COVID was you know I liked it because I was home for the first time I, I saw spring in its entirety and fall in its entirety without traveling you know, like I said, I got I got a dog. We got this rescue dog from the border of Mexico, Texas border, and I got to hang out with him for a year. And, and I got to work on a novel and not have to leave halfway through. Uh, so yeah, my only weird thing I did is I started buying like first edition novels of favorite books of mine because I was like, fuck, if I'm gonna die, I want to uh, die with my uh, favorite. You know, when everybody was kind of panicking at first, you're like. Well, I just gotta have I gotta have my favorite books near me, and and you yeah. know, and a fancy bottle of tequila, and you know, be all right, kind of thing. Stupid, but you know. You were filling your bunker with the important things for you. Yeah, man, I'm one of those guys. I like having my I like having my favorite books by me, like by my bed, so I can look at them. It's just like because I think of them as my favorite books and records. I think of them as is 
some of the best friends I've ever had. Um, and, and I think of them as like, if you're feeling really lonely and lost in the world, at least you got those pals with you. Cause the thing about a good book or a good record is, is you might change, but they never change. Oh, and, so they're always with you. And, and they'll always come back. They'll always be there for you. So, uh, uh, yeah. 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 Not to put too much of my own, you know, spin on that, but they always stay the same and yet you can get new things out of them. Like a few weeks ago, I listened to the white album all the way through again. And that's an album I started listening to when I was a teenager. And then now the way I listen to it is completely different. So it is very comforting and yet you can still keep getting more and more out of a good record, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the, the, the hardest thing about like the white album is, is you've heard some of those songs too much and maybe you hadn't, but like when I was a kid, man, the, you couldn't, you couldn't walk down the street without hearing the Beatles or, or Zeppelin. And, um, and so you get kind of tainted, but yeah, the white album is like one of the great records of all time. And if you, if you can, if you can get your mind wrapped around the fact, like the, 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 the famous songs on that record, if you act like you've never heard them before, or you just think of them as a, just normal songs and you can do that kind of trickery in your head. So you, you, you kind of forget that you're burned out on it. Um, okay. It's a genius. I mean, I don't know how those guys did it, but I mean, that's an amazing record. Yeah. Also Missy, uh, our music person and I argue about this, but I believe that there are certain songs on the white album that I have listened to enough now that I have earned the right to skip. And I know that she doesn't like that, but that's how I feel. Um, yeah, I I skipped some. Yeah. So Bill also asked if you think that this book is more of a timeless tale. And I think unfortunately parts of it are, but especially in Reno, we're seeing a lot of, you know, we have a, a housing crisis right now. So do you, did you write this book? Was it more influenced by things that you've seen? You know, you're talking about Donald Trump and the effects of Reaganomics but it, um, were you more affected by things that you've seen in the last few years? Or do you think this is a book that if we read it, you know, 20 years ago, we would get the same things out of? I mean, I think in one regard, I think it, it I mean, it's about uh, kind of the dis disintegration of a, an American family in a way. And um, and it's about uh, the burdens of of a family breaking down um and I, I mean that kind of stuff's always timeless because i think that's been going on since you know cavemen uh right. family dynamics and family breaking down um i do think all over the west uh there's a bigger rift between those that can afford and those that can't and i think in the last oh jesus i don't know just the way like the, the disappearance of 40 hour jobs uh, for like lower income people, um, lack of benefits. Um, I think all that stuff plays into this really crazy thing where in Portland, uh, Reno, San Francisco, Seattle, uh, Los Angeles, of course, so many cities where, where they, where housing prices just go through the roof and you start going like, well, God, how I could, like Lynette says, like, I can't, how, how much can I work? You know, yeah. like two jobs, like, like that's a game that you can't win at. Like when you're like working class person, you can't just like work two jobs and then afford it. Cause it's all of a sudden so much more expensive than that. So in, in Portland, there's literally thousands of these amazingly beautiful craftsman style houses. It's like old, old Reno, like those old beautiful brick houses, like a marsh in those areas. They're like the dream houses everyone wants. But when you think about it, all those houses were built for working class people or a lot of them or the houses around say Vassar and Wells in that area. Those are all just working class people's houses. And in Portland, it's the same. And then like here, you know, 10 years ago, those houses suddenly be, they are, you know, uh, pushing 100 years old and, and a lot of them need a lot of work are, are all of a sudden not in good shape, but also unaffordable mm -hmm. to working class people. So working class people can't even afford the working, the houses that were built for the working class. And I just thought that was interesting. And it makes you start, it just makes you start, I just started worrying, I guess. So in that, that case, it is all just about those that have and those that don't have and the haves and the have nots. And it's just trickier now because I don't understand how, you know, 10 years ago, a house would be 200,000 and now it's 250,000 or 450,000. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just like a, that's a big jump, and 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 a, and a guy just working a, some straight job can't can't figure out how to do that anymore. Right, and wages aren't rising with those housing prices, unfortunately. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And here in Reno, a lot of our our weekly motels that people live in are being uh, leveled, and then luxury housing is going in those places. So. Yeah, and I mean that was the one interesting thing about Reno is it kept the homeless population or the, the the more at risk fragile population at least had uh you know a roof over their heads uh i know i know the the struggles and the and and the hard thing about the, the weekly motels but they did keep a lot of people off the streets mm-hmm. yeah so i think one of the most interesting characters in the book is lynette's mother she's hard to love but at the same time I was talking to this with, about this with our owner, Christine, yesterday. She's a woman who seems at the end of her rope, but also she's kind of almost the villain in the story because it's her actions that kind of send Lynette into this danger this night. Um, I'm sorry if I don't have a, a great question with this. I just, I thought, you know, your characters aren't simply bad or simply good. And I think that's so amazing. And you, you write them with such humanity. Did you see any of your characters as just villains or did you try to inject something sympathetic or, you know, something, if you thought long enough, you could put yourself in their shoes. I mean, with Lynette's mom, I think the the idea is like, um, I mean, she's breaking up with her daughter. Yeah. My daughter says, look, that, let's buy this house together. Let's invest our lives together, more together. And I think the mom is tired. I mean, she's she's spent 20 years working at a job that doesn't quite give her enough hours. She's got, uh, you know, a, taking care of a developmentally disabled son. So that she she's just on this never ending. I'm broke and I'm tired and my son's always here and he needs a lot of help. Um, so I think when you meet her, she's, she's realizing that she's failed in her life and that she can't, she can't figure a way out of her life. And the daughter, I think, is saying, look, our, our way out is like investing in each other and buying this house. And you'll be surprised. We'll get to the other side. And the mom's saying, like, look, what, which, which so many people I, I've known over the years, they'll say, like, there's no point. So why not, why not, you know, uh, go to Vegas or go to Hawaii and go in debt or why not buy a fancy car on a payment plan? Cause at least I have something or I've done something cool in my life. Even if that thing, like in the beginning of the book, which I don't think is giving it away, the mom buys a fancy car a week before they're supposed to sign the papers. And I think it was a way for her to break up with Lynette, but also a way of her saying like, look, I deserve, I deserve one nice thing in my life. And the house we live in, I mean, they live in a tear down house next to a freeway mm-hmm. that's been a hard house for her. So I think you're just meeting Lynette's mom when she has a broken back. And when somebody's got a broken back like that, uh, they're hard to be around when someone's tired and you know, her health isn't great. And she's she's just worn out. And, and Lynette's been a handful uh, throughout her life, not to, and it's not Lynette's fault. So I don't, I don't dislike the mom. I think, you know, I, th- I think she's, she made some errors. She made the bad, a bad decision in who she married. Uh, she's made some bad errors in her life. And like so many people do, she doesn't see that, like, if she can just keep grinding it out and make little moves here and there, she'll be okay. She, she gives up. And so you're kind of seeing to give up or not to give up. And the, and the daughter saying, don't give up. And the, the mom saying, I'm giving up because I don't want to be around you. So it's hard. It's hard. It's, it's a hard story between those two. Yeah. yeah. And is this the first time that you've had a female main character? No, I wrote, uh, I, I, I wrote a novel called North Line, set in Reno, uh, North Line about a, about a woman that, that moves from Vegas to, to Reno. And I wrote about a nurse uh, in the furry. It was a pretty major character. So I've written, you know, I've written uh, women, major women characters, I guess, in my books before. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I thought Lynette was very relatable and real. So. Yeah, she was really, she was really fun, fun to write. 
I really like her. I mean, she's a tricky person. She's a tough, she's really tough and really kind of destructive at the same time. And, and really just kind of wounded. She's wounded in a way where no one's, it's like if she had a busted knee her whole life and then no one really ever told her what to do about it. They just, they just kind of stepped out of the way because it looked weird when she was walking by or they were scared of her or no one had time to, to look at her, the wound she has because, because her mom was just struggling. And, yeah. um, you know, and I think her mom at times really gave everything she had to her daughter. And then, you know, hey, you know, the reason I did the mother daughters just because I think if, if it was a son, he would have left, you know, oh, yeah, the son would have probably just bailed on the family and, and, you know, moved to Phoenix uh, uh, and, and, you know, sent his mom a nice present every winter. Uh, but I think Lynette feels really responsible and she feels uh, like she's linked to her brother. And I think she's also codependent on her brother. I don't think she knows how to live without him. Yeah. Well, and mother daughter relationships are very unique. And, yeah. Uh, how long did this one take you to write? It took a long time longer because it's just a short novel. Mm -hmm. it took me, uh, uh, you know, uh, three years maybe. Oh, you wow. know, I, I wrote half. Of, I wrote another half to this book uh, that didn't work, mm -hmm. and um, and that really was difficult. You know, I was really struggled with it. I had the, the, this basic novel done pretty quick. And then I wrote a whole other half about Lynette after she, after the end of the book. Um, and I just couldn't get it right. I, I, you know, and I tried and I tried and I tried and, I, and then eventually I just realized that's because the, the part, what became this, this book um, was just the thing I needed to say. Right. Yeah. I think the ending works perfectly. If my opinion matters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a long time to live in that world and with those characters, three years. That's a, that's a problem with with fiction, with writing novels is it just takes a long time. I mean, I mean and that's why, you know, uh, I always try to write about themes that really matter to me mm -hmm. and issues that, that, that I'll sacrifice for because it is a lot of, it's a lot of time and, and you know, it might fail. You know, I've written, a, I've not a lot of failed novels, but I've written a few that I just have to like, you know, put under the bed kind of thing and, and cry, you know, you cry over it and you get all bummed out and you think you're an idiot and, you know, uh, you have a big self-evaluation times after, uh, after you write a failed novel, but, um, but, but they just take a, they take a long time. So that's why I always, I try to write uh, ones that mean a lot to me anyway, whether they're good or not, I, I have no idea, but, but they have to mean something to me. Yeah. And did, forgive me if we already touched on this, but did being at home last year and COVID affect your writing uh, procedure or style or did well, you man, get a just, lot done or? Yeah, it just made it did uh, like, cause usually, cause I'm in a mom and pop band, you know, our outfit is like a all hands on kind of uh, little business. And so, so I, I end up doing so much kind of grunt work for the Delines that, and then touring for the Delines that, uh, um, that it takes up a lot of my time. And so this was the first time in, in I can't remember how 20 odd years that I just got to write and not worry about anything. Uh, it was really fun. So I, I feel, I feel kind of guilty because, you know, I live, I live in the country so I wasn't freaked out about because I never like hell. I barely see people <laughs> anyway, and uh, and uh, and you know I didn't have to, and uh, and I got to just work every day, and that's my favorite thing to do is is writing. So yeah, that's nice. Um, so Bill has another question. He asks, any news on further film adaptations of your work? Yeah, I mean they just I sold the rights to uh, um, to this one. Uh, the movie rights so um but i don't but but you never know with that stuff you just never know uh how long it'll take or 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 if it'll go anywhere but 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 i think it's a cool it's a cool company yeah. and i'm excited about it uh but you know i kind of stay stay out of it so i don't i don't really know what's gonna happen yeah is it weird seeing your work adapted it's in really that way when they did the motel life, you know, they did it in, in Reno and they did it at a lot of the places that I grew up going to. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that was really, really fun. Um, getting to, 
have these places documented. Um, I knew I knew that would be really fun, but again, it's not my thing. Um, you always want to change stuff. I knew I was in trouble when, like Chris Christopherson, was like one of the great songwriters and one of the cooler dudes probably ever made. <laughs> saying some of your lines but but they changed the lines a little bit and i was and like part of me was like fuck man don't say it like that say it like this <laughs> and when i got to that point i was like oh i gotta leave this is not my thing yeah you know um so it's really fun if you don't take it seriously it's really fun yeah uh, and so and it's you know it's really nice that they care about the story and you just you hope your your story translates uh, and doesn't ruin anybody's career and that sort of thing. But it's it's if you take it seriously, I think it could be a fucking nightmare. Um, but I decided not to take it seriously, and and I, I don't have a lot of involvement in it. Um, yeah. 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 Well, Bill also asks if screenwriting is something you'd ever consider because he thinks your style is very cinematic. Wow. Oh, thanks, Bill. I like this, Bill. Uh, uh, no, you know, I think about that all the time. You know. Um, but the issue I always have with it is is juggling a band and, and novels and novel the novel is my favorite thing and being in a band is like a close second mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and if you throw in a third thing um, I don't know if I could do it well and then it'd take up so much time and the other problem with screen screenwriting is there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen and yeah. so uh, and 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 you've I've already spent through like three years on the night always comes so I'd end, I'd end up spending probably a year's worth of time in the next three years tinkering on it and and so I don't know I don't know I, I like the idea of screenplays and I love movies more than anything but I don't think I got I just don't think I have the time yeah yeah um, well, we're going to wrap it up here in a few minutes. If anybody wants to ask a last question, I always like to ask though, is there anything great that you've read recently or any good books you'd like to recommend to people? Yeah, I don't even, I, you know, I'm on a big, uh, 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 Megan Abbott kick. I know she has a new one out, but I haven't read her new one. Mm. I think anything by her is really, really good. I just read a really cool one by uh, William Boyle. I'm reading an old school one. Uh, you know, the New York Times, not New York Review of Books, does all those reissues. Mm -hmm. And I'm reading Nightmare Alley right now. Have you ever read that? No. I forget the guy's name who wrote it. But I was reading, I, I started that last night and I, I'm, I've been reading all these uh, like hobo books from the 30s uh, huh? um, that I like, like Edward Anderson, a couple of his books. Um, I'm trying to think, and I'm reading a book by Tom Cromer, K-R-O-M-E-R, uh, Waiting for Nothing, which is about being a, like a bomb during the 30s. Um, yeah, I guess that'd be, that's where my head's at. And then up for musically, I've just been hitting up uh, your coworker, Misty. She's got the greatest uh, picks on um, ambient music. So like if, if, if you live in Reno, just go to Sundance if you want. A good tips on well any music but man that that lady knows her stuff as far as uh like weird instrumental stuff oh yeah definitely yeah well those are great recommendations thank you sure. all right since we don't have any more questions i think i'm going to say thank you so so much willie for being here and for talking to me and for sharing some of your book the night always comes which is available now and thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you later.